what do you think we're doing as far as today's uh, Not much. I'll let you, if we've got time, do anything you want to do. Um, okay. I'm just going to. I was just going to briefly mention that we're going to have the uh, competition at the end. Okay. Uh, but. Uh, Okay, let's run through your lab handout. Um, you should pay particular attention when we do this and correct things on your lab handout because those are going to be kind of your study guides for the first lab quiz. So you'll go back and review the lab handouts. Okay, for the bead experiment, this is typical of some data we've gotten in the past, which was entered on the board where every group recorded absorbance readings of various temperatures, and then you got your data that you could put into SATBOOK. So SATBOOK could calculate your mean, your standard deviation, and then more importantly, your comparative t-values, okay? So you'll have a little matrix that looks something like this that allows you to compare the temperatures to see if the t-value for that mean comparison was significantly different or not. In this particular example, what's the degrees of freedom? N was 7. There were 7 groups. So degrees of freedom is 7 minus 1 plus 7 minus 1, or 12. And if you look that up in the T table, that critical or expected T value is 2.179 for 95% confidence. So when you start looking at this table, you have to ask yourself, does the calculated value exceed the tabular value? In this particular case, for minus 5 compared to all four of these temperatures, the difference is significant at the 95% confidence level. Here it's not, okay? Not significant. Just barely, okay? Not, yes. So you needed to go through and determine which one of those differences were significant. In the first three lab sections, most of the differences were significant. I think out of the 15 possible comparisons, in most labs, it was like 11 or 12 of them were significant. Thursday was a little bit different. We'll talk about that in a second why. But I think there were only five significant differences for Thursday's lab. And it was really all of the minus five temperatures compared to everything else. So make sure that you know how to do that when you start evaluating your data is to determine which differences are significant. OK, we ask you to do a graph. And the graph was asked to plot your absorbance versus your temperature, um, the mean absorbance for the class data versus temperature. <clears throat> when you do a graph, we're going to be picky. You have to have things on the correct axis, OK? What goes on the x-axis, dependent or independent variable? Is it? Which one of the variables do you measure, the dependent or the independent? The dependent is the one you measure. Okay. So, so in this case, absorbance depends upon the temperature. Okay, temperature doesn't depend upon the absorbance. So the dependent variable goes on the y-axis, and the independent variable goes on the x-axis. We had some people that shifted up axis. That's just convention, okay? That's how scientists are expecting a graph to look. And so we're going to follow convention. Um, it's very important that you have units if they are applicable. So for temperature, degrees Celsius was unit. Absorbance is one of the few times when you can get by without putting a unit, okay? Sometimes people will put optical density unit or something like that, but technically speaking, you don't need a unit for absorbance. Titles. Title has to reflect what's going on in the experiment. I like to ask myself, is there something about the dependent and independent variable in that particular title? So in this particular case, the effect of temperature on heat membrane. So this absorbance is a measure of what's happening to the heat membranes. So don't just use the default title, which says like absorbance versus time, for example. That's not descriptive enough. <clears throat> okay, so what's going on here when you look at this particular data? Well, you're seeing kind of a trend, and you've got this kind of parabolic relationship right here in this particular lab session. 
where you're getting a lot of damage at the high temperature, you're getting a fair amount of damage at the cold temperature, and then we get minimal damage at room temperature, okay? So that's the general kind of trend you can see from the graph. The next question asks you then, does the data support your trend that you're seeing, okay? So what do you have to do? You have to base that analysis on, on statistical realities. And you have to say, for example, if you say, some of you said extremes in temperature cause the most damage. Does the data support that? Well, it does here, okay? But you also have to ask yourself the question, is there a significant difference between the two extremes? If they're not, then the data doesn't support that generality that extremes have an effect. But you might have to modify that and say, well, if this isn't significantly different than this, then you have to modify that particular statement a little bit. Let's take a look at some of your individual data from your particular lab sections. And I apologize, for some reason I couldn't get established to put the temperatures in here. Um, so here's the data from Monday lab. Degrees of freedom eight. Uh, the critical T value was 2.306. So you see the same kind of parabolic relationship right here that we had before in the previous data. Okay? So what's happening here? Well, it looks like as you both increase temperature and decrease temperature, that there is damage to the beat membranes. Does the data support that? Okay. Well, you're going to have to know whether this difference is significant compared to this difference, for example. Okay. So you'd have to go back and either look at your data, or if you plotted it using these things right here, what are these called? You know what those vertical lines are called on the graph? Pardon me? The margin of error. Margin of error, error bars. It represents the high and the low values in your data. And typically speaking, if these error bars overlap one another, the differences aren't going to be significant. Okay? So if you go back and actually look at your data, there's a significant difference between these two, but there is not a significant difference between these two, nor these two, nor these two, nor these two. And so when you're analyzing your data, you have to start kind of comparing data points to see if that is consistent with the general statement that you are making based upon examination of your data. So right here, there is a significant difference between cold temperature and warm temperature at 75. Okay? So your statement would then be really that colder temperatures seem to have the maximum effect you wouldn't say that extreme temperatures have an equal effect because those are different values, okay? If you look at Tuesday's lab, we're getting a, a similar type of relationship. Again, this difference isn't significant. This one, yeah, probably is. And so you kind of need to compare things to one another, especially to the mid value, in our case, the control, and say, well, as we increase temperature, we get a difference, but it's not significant here. It's not significant here, okay? So comparing those points gives you some insight into your data, and that's what I was hoping that you would do. Here's Wednesday's lab. So you're seeing a similar trend all the way through. Thursday's lab I wanted to comment on. Oh, uh, wait, no, what's that? It's Wednesday. It's the same graph. Doing the same graph. Why do you do that? Huh. I put in four different graphs. Um, I'll just have to explain it to you. What we had uh, in Thursday's lab was we had a huge error bar right here in this particular reading. I think it was Thursday's lab. And even though this mean was quite a bit lower than this one, the difference wasn't significant because there was one data point out of the four that was really different than the others. We had an absorbance value of two for one group where the others were like 0.2 or 0.4 or something like that. So that one data point, which seemed to be anomalous, made that error bar huge and it made this difference not significant. And the re part of the reason that one value had so much effect is because the end value was so small. Right. Had the end value been significantly larger, like 10, and you had that one anomalous 
uh, measurement that was so different from the others, the effect of that one anomalous measurement would have been far less significant. <coughs> A lot of you overlook question number seven on the back of that page, asking you to cite four potential sources of error. So make sure you look through your lab questions and answer all of them. Uh, possible errors that we have thought of are, you might not have rinsed the beet segments or rinsed them well so that there was pigment on the outside of them from cutting the tissue. You might have left it at the aside temperature for too little time or too long time. You might have soaked it in the water too little or too long. Um, you might have done something with your absorbance readings. You might not have blanked it properly, set the wavelength properly, et cetera. That's one of the downsides of us breaking things up into groups and then pooling the data is that all the error from individual groups gets kind of aggregated. If one group did all of the experiments, then you would get far less chance that these kind of mistakes would be occurring. Do not, when asked sources of error, say, Human error. All of these are human errors. What we want you to realize is what were the human errors that may have caused the problem. Most of the errors are going to be human. The machines only do what they're told. All right? So to just say human error really is a cop-out. What was the human error? Each of these is a human error. Uh, one that we don't have on the list there that we probably should follow up on is you're all working on different spectrophotometers and they are different models even. And so one of the things we probably should be doing is taking a common solution and putting in all the specs and see if it's giving the same reading in all of those spectrophotometers. If not, that'll be variability. One of the things that you will see today when you try to do enzyme assays is that little errors Human errors in pipetting can have a big effect on the outcome. Okay? So the point isn't that, you, that the humans erred. What was the error? And if you want to improve the quality of the data, make it more rep, uh, replicable, right? you have to be able to look at the process that you're doing and see where are the points where Humans can make a mistake that can affect the outcome. That's what science research is all about, figuring out where are the potential sources of error. Where could I screw up and really mess up the experiment? And you do what you can to keep that from happening. And that's, that's not in the lab. That could be in collecting samples in the field. Okay, uh, the dialysis experiment, uh, you all should have had some data that you collected about reactions inside the bag, outside the bag, solution B outside the bag, and then you should answer several questions. The first question was, if permeable to iodine? The answer should have been yes, because I think in everybody's case, a blue color developed within the bag, there was initially starch in the bag, but no iodine in the bag, the only way that blue color developed was that the iodine reacted with the starch, and so the membrane was permeable to the iodine. Was it permeable to water? Very likely it was because it gained weight. And the weight gain could not be explained by the uptake of just sugar or some other substance. We didn't add enough of those things to the solutions to account for the kind of weight gain that you would have been seeing. And so by default, it was kind of, it must be water. Was it permeable to starch? It shouldn't have been because starch is a large molecule, but how would you verify that? If the bag were permeable to starch, after time your solution B should have turned blue. Okay? Sometimes you'll get a leak in the bag. And if you get a leak in the bag and the starch leaks out through a leak and it turns blue, then you could come up with a conclusion that was consistent with your data, even though it was an error because it was a result of a leaky bag. Was it permeable to glucose? Um, it depends on whether your Benedict's test for solution B was positive or not. Some of you got a positive test, some of you got a negative test. But in some cases, you would answer, it is permeable to glucose, for example. You would say yes, but then I'd look at your data and you would have a negative for glucose in solution B. So make sure that your answers are consistent with your data. Okay, 
the one that probably is most difficult to deal with and most difficult to wrap your head around is the yeast transport experiment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through this with you and I'm going to show you some pictures of what things are supposed to look like and what conclusions you can draw from those particular results. Um, I will make this available, I'll try emailing it to you first, as a way to study for your lab exam. Because you need to be able to go through the logic of this and say, I can make this conclusion based upon this observation. Because what I'm going to do on the lab quiz is, I will give you a similar type of experiment, similar procedures where you use sodium carbonate, neutral red, etc. But I will give you different outcomes than you got. And then ask you similar questions like, does this suggest that it is permeable to sodium carbonate? Does this suggest that active transport is occurring? So you have to understand the logic, okay? So we dealt with two flasks, flask A and flask B. A was boiled, so what is boiling gonna do? It is gonna kill the cells. Flask B had living cells. And so those experiments compare living to dead cells. For a membrane to maintain its permeability, its selective permeability, Cells typically have to be alive. Dead cells are going to lose their permeability. Okay, so that's one of the things you did by boiling is you just messed up those cell membranes and the selective permeability was lost. So let's take a look at flask A first, the boiled flask, okay? So we mixed one gram of yeast, 25 mils of sodium carbonate, and we boiled it. So what do we expect to see? Well, we typically expect to see something like this. This is the color that yeast look like in a solution. Now, does sodium carbonate have any color in and of itself? No, it's a clear solution, okay? Then we add the neutral red, okay? What does neutral red do? It is an acid base indicator. So you have to always ask yourself when you're looking at the colors in these, is the color some form of orangish yellow which is what color neutral red is in a basic environment, or is it some form of reddish color, which is the color neutral red is in an acidic environment? So we added that and we got an orangish yellow color, okay? So now we've got yeast cells, we've got base, and we've got neutral red. And a color change has occurred. Well, that's due to the neutral red interacting with the base. But where is that reaction occurring? Is it happening in the solution? or is it happening in the cells? So that's why we split it, the sample in half, okay? And we filtered half of that so we could see the color of the cells and the color of the solution or the filtrate. So here's typically what you'll see. Here's the cells. So they were tannish before, right? And now they're a different color. So what does that tell you? Is there neutral red in these cells? Yeah, because otherwise they're tan, right? And what is the pH of that, of that neutral red? Is it acidic or basic? It's this orangish color, this yellowish orangish color, and that indicates a basic pH. So does that suggest that sodium carbonate is in those cells as well? <coughs> it does, okay? We look at the solution that drifts through. Is there neutral red in this solution? Yeah, this is the color of neutral red in a basic environment. Is there sodium carbonate in there? Okay. So the conclusions that we can gain so far are that neutral red entered the cells and that sodium carbonate also entered the cells. Now, we took the other half and we acidified it, okay? By acidification, we're changing the pH. So now you can very clearly again see that there's neutral red here. It turned red because we added the acetic acid, okay? We filter and we look at what's going on inside the cells. So the cells turn this bright pink fuchsia color is there neutral red in the cells? Yeah, otherwise they'd be tan. Is there acetic acid in those cells? Yeah, okay. 
So the solution, whoops. So the solution has neutral red in it. That's where the neutral red started out. The yeast cells have neutral red in it. So some of the neutral red moved from the cells into the, from the uh, solution into the cells. That is consistent with movement by diffusion because we reach an equilibrium. There's color in both places. So everything entered the cells. Sodium carbonate entered the cells. Neutral red entered the cells. Acetic acid entered the cells. Are these cells differentially permeable? Nope, we killed them. And we destroyed the selective permeability of the membranes. Okay, so that's flask A. Flask B is a little trickier. Okay, here's our sodium carbonate and our neutral red. So again, this is the color of that dye in a basic pH, an orangeish yellow color. Now we add yeast, and what happens? We get the salmon color, so there's red. What does that indicate? Neutral red in an acidic environment. But have we added any acid to it? No. There's neutral red, there's sodium carbonate, and there's yeast cells. And now all of a sudden, poof, acidic indicator. So there's a couple of possibilities. One is that there could be something secreted by the cell into the solution that was turning the neutral red. red. The other possibility is the neutral red was entering the cell and when it got in the cell, it encountered an acid environment. So how do we distinguish between those two possibilities? We filter. And the cells were red. So are there neutral red in those cells? Yes. Is there sodium carbonate in those cells? No, because sodium carbonate is a base. And the color of this would be orangish yellow in the presence of a base. So it's this observation right here that really answers that very last question. Is the cytoplasm of the living yeast cell acidic or base? This suggests that it is acidic. The neutral red goes inside the cell and changes color when it gets inside because it is acidic there. We look at the solution, and it is clear. You go, wait a minute now. Initially, that solution had neutral red in it. Where did it go? Well, maybe it's just hard to see the neutral red in that solution. So that's one of the reasons why we acidify that solution. So we acidify that solution, and any neutral red that's in there should have turned red. It still doesn't turn red. That's pretty good evidence that there's not neutral red in there. So what's happening? It started out in the solution, it went into the cells, and it kept going into the cells until it was all moved into the cell. Is that moving down a concentration gradient? No, that's accumulating. It keeps accumulating, and eventually it moves against its own concentration gradient. That's not active transport. So if you look at 7A and 7B, this was your last filtered solution in 7A where there was still neutral red in the environment. It was in the cells too, so that's diffusion. Here it's all been moved out of the cells, out, out of the environment, and all accumulated in the cells. That's active transport. Okay? So these yeast cells are accumulating neutral red by active transport, and the data suggests that they are differentially permeable and don't allow sodium carbonate in, the data suggests that their cytoplasm is an acidic pH. That makes sense. Okay, I will post these or send them to you, and as you prepare for the lab exam, make sure you can go through this particular logic and understand how you can draw these conclusions based upon the observation. And if you have any difficulty with that, Talk to Austin, talk to Dr. Morton, talk to me, but make sure that you get that straightened out.
Okay. Um, I'll turn this over to Dr. Morton in a little bit for just a couple of comments. But today you're going to start a two-week, well, actually, three-week project, right? Almost. They have a presentation too on enzymes. And one of the things that we're going to do today for this weekend lab is learn how to do something that's called an enzyme assay. And one of the things that we do in an enzyme assay is measure the rate of reaction of the enzyme catalyzed reaction. And then next week, you're going to look at some environmental effects on that enzyme reaction. Today, you're going to learn how to do the reaction you're going to run what we call a baseline reaction. And that's going to be the enzyme assay conducted under what we call standard conditions. And you want to make sure that you can repeat and get very similar, if not identical, results every time you run this enzyme assay under these baseline conditions. So today is all about learning technique, basically, and then also learning how to use LogRepro to automate collecting your data. Um, we'll run several trials without using Logger Pro where you'll actually use the spectrophotometer and manually collect data. Um, then toward the end we will have you run the same experiment again using Logger Pro. And to give you a little incentive, there's going to be um, some optional points awarded for the groups within each lab that get the most repeatable data over at least two trials, is that correct? I believe. They've got to turn in their best two, I think. Yeah. Um, so here's some data from a past lab, and it's pretty hard to see right here, but there are actually two plots right here which just superimpose one another exactly. One of them is a green line and one of them is a purple line. They're not all going to look this good, okay? but we're going to encourage you to try to run this assay several times so that you can get something that is very repeatable. That's going to be important uh, next week when you do your experiment because you have to run replicates of your data and you want to make sure that your replicates are close to one another, if not dead on. So did you want to say we've got a couple minutes to anything about it? There will be a quiz before the lab, and it will focus on pages one and two of the lab um, write-up. Page three is, proce is procedure, and I'm not going to uh, get into that. All right, in general, what we're going to be doing is be we're going to take in our particular case, we have two substrates, right? We mix them together in the presence of an enzyme, and we get two products. Right? Our enzyme is peroxidase. Isolated from turnips, which is there to inactivate a very toxic compound, H2O2 hydrogen peroxide, right? One of our products is going to be water. Now we need to, in some way, figure out how to monitor what is a oxidation reduction reaction. Well, this is going to get reduced. All right? So whenever you have something being reduced, something has to be oxidized. In a cell, the things that are oxidized in this reaction are often things like uh, vitamin A, vitamin E, ascorbate, right? Well, we're going to make it a little easier on ourselves. We're going to use a compound called glycol. Which is colorless in its oxidized, in its reduced form. But in its oxidized form, it's tan or brown. Right? And whenever we have a uh, color change, 
we can monitor it with a spectrophotometer. Right. Conceptually, this is what we're doing. When we mix things together, we generally have one tube with the substrate, one tube with the enzyme. We mix them together, and then we measure one or the other of the products. So part of your challenge today, and this is basically a practice lab, not to be blown off because next week you're actually going to look at, as Dr. Browder said, some environmental factors affecting the enzyme. What is an enzyme? Biochemically, what is an enzyme? Pardon me? It's a protein. It has primary, secondary, tertiary structure, no quaternary structure in this case. All right? So, if it's the enzyme that catalyzes the reaction, what types of environmental factors are going to affect the function of the enzyme? Temperature, pH. What's going to affect how quickly this thing can generate a product? Of concentration of the enzyme. What else? In order for this to produce this, it has to interact with these. All right? So we know if we have more of this, it's going to go faster. What else can affect the rate of the reaction? How much substrate is available? All right? So you're going to learn today how to run this assay accurately and repeatably. That's the objective of the entire uh, afternoon. Right? Now, initially, as Dr. Browder said, you're going to collect your data manually, All right. but then, hopefully, we will hook you up to a computer where instead of visually trying to read the spectrophotometer at certain time intervals, it will collect real-time data. Oh, well, I think we said... No, it's not that much. Let's say it's one, per, one data point per second. So here's our time in seconds and our absorbance. Right? And one of the ways in which you put the unit, you can put units for absorbance in scope parentheses at, in our case, 470 nanometers. Right? And it will show you a real-time accumulation of your product, in this case, our, our oxidized glycol. Ideally, what we want is for you to be able to run multiple reactions and have them be virtually identical. It's hard to do. If you don't get to that point, don't feel like you've failed. Because when we do this next week, we actually have a way of averaging values um, on the, on the uh, graph. So that will uh, eliminate some of the variation. Okay. The two biggest things to get consistent results are accurate pipetting, which is a challenge. How much of this you add, how much of this you add, how much of that you add, how much... No, this is an aqueous solution, so it's in water. And then the other thing is, is you have your enzyme and your substrates in different tubes, and you have to mix them together, and then pour it into a cuvette, put it in the spectrophotometer, and take your readings. And so that mixing time and making sure you're consistent about how long it is from mixing to taking your first reading is the other big brain. Today is an opportunity for you to try and fail, and try and fail, but eventually to try and do. All right? You don't often get a chance like this. Um, before you start, uh, we'll pass these down. Before you start taking your quiz, if you would look at question number 10 for me when you get your quiz. There's something that I need to point out to you. So 
look at question number 10, and it has some information in the stem of the multiple choice question. And then it says, First, it says, during the laboratory experiment, you discovered that an enzyme catalyzed reaction is the delta G of that minus goes with the 20 kilocals per mole. Okay, so make sure you know that's a minus 20 kilocals per mole. The minus is on one line, and then the number is on the next line. So make sure you know that negative is there. <laughs> I think that happened too. Yeah, that's the Even though you don't have a space between right. the minus sign and that, it puts a different line. <laughs> 